My name is Dominique Carr. I'm a senior at Mission Bay High School, and I will be your moderator to for today. And I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anita Raj, who is a director at UCSD Center of Gender Equity and Health and is a professor, professor in the Division of Global Public Health in the Department of Medicine. And for the past 20 years, Dr. Raj has been involved with various community-based organizations working for immigrant rights um, and against gender-based violence. Currently, Dr. Raj has projects for, related to adolescent girls, early marriage, and reproductive and maternal health. And her current research is based in South Asia, United States, and Russia. And this session will be recorded, so when we start the question and answers, um, I recommend, and I, I don't recommend, but I say that, you do not state your name or what school you go to for privacy reasons, and you, you may begin. Okay, all right. So today what I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, the title of this talk was uh, Global Challenges to Women's Health. Women's health is substantial. Um, it, can, it encompasses the lifespan, and it can include uh, things like chronic disease, um, uh, child survival, um, uh, maternal and child health, reproductive health. I'm going to really focus today on more of the maternal child reproductive health issues that are related to the early marriage of girls and young motherhood, which uh, we often call adolescent motherhood. Um, so a little bit about the situation globally. Girl-child marriage and adolescent childbirth is more likely to ha happen in contexts of poverty, low resources, and gender inequities. And gender inequities, I mean GBV, uh, gender-based violence. So gender-based violence includes things like partner violence. It includes, uh, which disproportionately affects women and girls, so that could be in dating violence, or it can mean spousal violence. Um, it also includes sexual violence, not in relationships, and sexual exploitation, things like trafficking, um, forced sex trade. It includes sun preference. In some parts of the world, there are preferen there's preference to wanting to have sons rather than daughters. Many people are aware of this issue in South Asia, but I think people would be surprised to know that we're seeing the issue in the United Kingdom, in Canada, um, and in parts of Africa as well. We also talk about it with regard to restrictions on reproductive rights and access to care. The rights of women to control their reproductive practices, women and girls to control their reproductive practices, we view as a fundamental human right and something that does differentially affect women and girls relative to men and boys. Um, so I don't want to detract from the fact that there are gender equity issues that affect males, that disadvantage males. Things like child soldiers. We are more likely to see males, substantially more likely to see males be child so soldiers. And other kinds of what we would refer to as occupational risks. Um, we are more likely to see uh, men and boys um, be engaged in certain kinds of occupations that put them at increased risk for death. However, what I'm going to focus on today is really about those ways that women and girls, because of a lesser value or treatment or opportunity in a society, have the health compromised for both themselves and the children that they have or may have. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So as a first step, what I want to do is kind of focus on where adolescent childbirths occur. Because as I said, I, I thought it would be most interesting to an adolescent audience to talk about adolescent health issues. So with regard to girl-child marriage and adolescent childbirth, we can see that the darker shading is indicative of higher rates of adolescent childbirth. And you can see that um, Sub-Saharan Africa has the darkest shades, and that is because that has got the highest rates, which means the proportions of the population affected are greatest in Sub-Saharan Africa. But South Asia has the greatest numbers. India alone has one point, more than 1.2 billion people. So even if the proportion is smaller, the numbers are substantial. If you look at the idea that 45% of um, adolescents will marry, uh, girls will marry, at uh, age 14 to 18, that means that about 11 million girls married under the age of 18 last year in India alone. So you can see how the numbers really add up, even though if you look in Chad, for example, you may see a 70% prevalence rate of girl-child marriage. Latin America, and this includes Mexico, is very interesting because although it has lower proportions of child marriage, 
um, and uh, adolescent childbirth. Importantly, it is when it is the only the Latin American Caribbean region is the only region of the world where we're seeing an increase in the rate of adolescent childbirth in the country. This, these issues are not unique to um, these regions of the world. They also affect the U.S. with the populations that are the most vulnerable socially. So populations that are um, have less access to health services, like rural areas or more. Um, populations more affected by poverty are more likely to have experiences of um, young motherhood and in some cases even uh, marriage before the age of 18. Although it's not very common in the U.S., we will are more likely to see it um, in the most vulnerable populations. So what creates the situation of early marriage of girls and the subsequent motherhood that may occur? Um, or uh, situations of early pregnancy, which can at times result in, in early marriage. The first is, as I mentioned, the social inequities. Then the gender inequities. What are the opportunities for girls? Is it worth um, preventing a pregnancy for the opportunity college and education, a job might bring if you don't see any opportunity for an education, college, a job? Would it be as hard to fight um, for what that would offer? Uh, I mean, would it be worth fighting for what that would offer if you thought that the fight would be unlikely one you could win because you've seen so few people achieve it? Um, at the same time, you know, the role of being a mother is an incredibly wonderful and important one. And so there are many girls who want that because if you don't see other opportunities, and positions and status that you could achieve, and this is one you could, you may be more invested in having that opportunity to be a mother at a young age. And you have to think about that and understand that and think, well, if you don't feel that this is the best health um, decision in a girl's life, but she feels it as the best social decision, how can you support her to recognize or have other opportunities for herself? So girls also, the ones that are most vulnerable to these um, issues are also ones that may come from family circumstances that are very unstable, where there may be violence. And so the girls may actively look for an opportunity to be able to leave the household. And marriage or young motherhood can provide that opportunity. So this may be a short-term solution for some girls, or it may be a normative practice, something that's often done in a given community but it has social and health consequences that we really, really need to understand. And I want to talk a little bit about what those are. So there's the impact on the social development and the social opportunity that girls have when there is girl-child marriage and young motherhood. This is a group that's more likely to have come from poverty, but it's also a group more likely to remain in poverty. That the girl who marries early or has a birth at a young age is going to have a, a lower likelihood that if she is in poverty, moving her and her family out of poverty. She is less likely to come into a marriage with an education in many parts of the world affected. But regardless of countries, what we also see is that the girls who have an adolescent childbirth are less likely to continue with their education. Now, again, if you don't think education is going to get you very far, and yours is clearly a group that has um, opportunity for education, engagement in education, but not everybody does. If you don't think education is going to get you very far, it's going to be harder to feel like that is worthwhile to give up what a perception of a pregnancy might offer you. Um, but for girls where there is an opportunity to have an education, or to be able to continue an education because in some places they may have the schools but they don't have bathrooms. And you can see that in those places you'll see girl dropout rates very high because once menstruation starts, um, bathrooms are needed. And so if there's not a bathroom, it's going to be a very vulnerable place for a girl to be able to continue with her education. So don't take your education for granted because there's many girls who don't even get the choice even when you can see that there's schools available, the school's infrastructure doesn't support the girls continuing with education. And so that will affect the likelihood she may marry and become pregnant, but at the same time, if she becomes pregnant, it will affect the likelihood she would continue with the education. And then low resource areas. If there's opportunity for advancement 
because you can see local industry, this may be less likely to happen. But in rural areas, in low resource areas generally, you're going to see choices made that may not be about advancing to the next level because those choices don't appear to exist. So, but what about the health consequences of early marriage and pregnancy themselves? There's a number of them. One is that there's more likely to be social isolation, mobility restrictions. A baby, how many of you have seen a baby before? How many of you have had to spend more than an hour with a baby? Raise your hand. How many of you feel like that is something that you'd really enjoy doing and watching a movie at the same time. Raise your hand. As someone who had two and really loves both of them, they were very unpleasant movie companions. So um, it really does restrict your um, mobility. But oftentimes, you know, if you're coming from a rural area where things like child marriage and adolescent pregnancy are more likely, that mobility may not have been very strong anyway. Also, there's um, this issue of gender-based violence. You're more likely to be in a situation as a, um, an adolescent wife or someone, uh, an, adol uh, an adolescent mother, you're more likely to be contending with a situation where the partner is abusive. Um, and that in itself can re restrict mobility because an abusive partner can also have the greater ability to tell you where to go, when to go, how to go, and not really give you a whole lot of choice about what you get to do. Not surprisingly, you see severe mental health consequences, not the least of which is suicidality or the desire to commit suicide. We did a study in um, Afghanistan where we reviewed the, burn, the uh, burn cases from hospitals, from three hospitals. I'm sorry, from hospitals in three regions of Afghanistan. And what we found was the single greatest predictor of likelihood that um, uh, or the single greatest um, reason given for the burns that occurred, most of which resulted in death, was when they went back to get the case stories, they found that almost all of these girls or women had an experience of forced or child marriage and, uh, or were contending with domestic violence, so the abusive husbands or abusive in-laws in the household. Um, and this gets into the issue of control from in-laws. Bear in mind, when you are an adolescent, um, and I'm sure you guys never feel like this, but people sure think they can tell you what to do, right? Because ultimately, are you viewed as an adult or a child? Child. Uh, that doesn't necessarily change because you've had a baby or you've gotten married. And so the likelihood of in-laws feeling an entitlement to control your behavior, your decisions, even the decision to be able to have a baby or not have a baby, the decision to use contraception, the decision to be able to use, to have the right to leave the house to go and get health care, is all under, um, or can be very, or is more likely to be affected by what the in-laws say. Because you can very, very typically be viewed as a child still. What does it mean for maternal and reproductive health? That's probably what I've done most of my research on. So a recent report from um, the uh, United Nations documents that, it's actually UNFPA specifically, documents that 95% of adolescent births in the developing world occurs in the context of girl-child marriage, that adolescent pregnancy um, is a tr uh, that 23% of the overall burden of disease attached to pregnancy in a childbirth is attributed specifically to adolescent pregnancy. That 65% of the obstetric fistula cases, are you familiar with this trend? Of, okay, this is the tearing that can occur in the delivery process. Um, the tearing that can occur can cause uh, urine or anal leakage, and it can result in very severe infections as well. Um, that 60, so it's a very, very, um, difficult issue that is more likely in the context where there's not medical care to help with sewing when tearing occurs. 65% of cases like this start in adolescence. And that in context of adolescent marriage um, and adolescent sexual activity, this is the population least likely to use contraception and most likely to report that they don't have reproductive control. In other words, there are other decision makers to whether they use contraception to whether they will have children, to whether they are required to continue to try to have children even if they've just had a child. 
<clears throat> what does this mean for the health of the children that they have? Well, there's 50 to 100% higher risk for neonatal death. I mentioned in the presentation today that we've seen it being at increased risk for infant mortality, but also child mortality. You're more likely to have preterm labor. An adolescent is growing. You are still growing. And your development requires the nutritional resources you take in to be used for that growth. For the girl that is now also growing the fetus, which also needs nutritional resources, now you've got a situation. Who gets those nutritional resources, the fetus or the mother? That really compromises the health and the safety and the development of not just the mother, I'm sorry, not just the, the, the um, fetus, but also the mother. And it compromises her risk around the delivery of the baby and the likelihood that that child will survive, but also what the weight is of that child. We see that there's more likely to be very little weight gain with the adolescent mothers in a lot of these low resource situations. Because remember, there's food insecurity. It's inadequate food and not just inadequate food, inadequate nutritional, um, uh, nutritious food. So what is that going to mean for this girl who is trying to grow her body at the same time as trying to grow a fetus? So you see child malnutrition. It's associated with gender inequities, other kinds of inequities, as I mentioned before. So I won't go through those again. So these are just a series of graphs so that you can see these are countries um, in the developing world. And you can see that those where the countries have lower rates of infant mortality um, have also got lower rates of child marriage. So you can see that's why the slope goes up. So the more child marriage there is in country, the higher the infant mortality rate. The, more, the, the higher the adolescent fertility rate, which means um, the number of, of births to the young mothers of 15 to 19, the higher the infant mortality rate. The contraception use, though, the more the adolescent uses contraception, you can see the infant mortality rate declines. And now we see the same pattern with maternal mortality, with child marriage going higher, means higher maternal mortality, means high, with age fertility rate going higher, um, you see higher maternal mortality. But again, when contraceptive use occurs for adolescents, um, you see lower maternal mortality. So what this overall means is that girl-child marriage and the subsequent adolescent pregnancy and motherhood are rooted in social and gender inequities, and they have severe health consequences but, and social consequences. Um, that what we need to reduce, uh, child marriage really needs to consider a regional context because we see differences by world region, that we need to um, consider what happens before marriage to prevent the practice, at marriage to prevent the child, uh, the, the pregnancy, and during marriage to think about the spacing of pregnancies that may occur. Youth leadership models offer an important opportunity, and I'm going to just show you why quickly. We're doing a pro project in the field right now in India that was focusing on understanding adolescents and their parents, ideologies around early marriage and girl choice in marriage, contraception use, and partner violence. And here are some of the findings. What you can see is a generational difference on education. You can see that most boys and girls are getting an education. And for the boys, I'm sorry, for, but when you look at the moms, 22% were likely to have had no formal education. So you're seeing a generational change. If you look at choice, just being able to have the right, a girl's right to choose who they marry, 49% of these fathers did not think that was a right a girl should have. That's of concern, but of greater concern to me is almost one in five of the girls did not think they should have the right to decide who they should marry. The notion of contraception use in marriage, females, both mothers and daughters, were less likely than their age-related counterparts, husbands and boys, to believe that contraception shouldn't be used, and that was 86% for the girls. These young girls do not think contraception use should be used in marriage which means if they marry and they have this ideology, what's the likelihood they're going to use contraception? High or low? What's the likelihood, based on what I showed you, that there could be an infant or maternal death due to non-use of contraception of these girls? Right. Let's talk about domestic violence for a moment. Is it acceptable? So if you look at um, cooking food, this is usually the one. Well, let's, let's, let's do neglects, house, or children. 
you see about one in five of the, uh, one in five or more of moms, dads, and boys think it is acceptable for a husband to beat his wife if she neglects the house or children. Even for the girls, more than one in 10 thought this was acceptable. So what this means is there's substantial opportunity to alter the normative ideologies that underlie these practices. And who's, who's got, with the exception of the girls around the contraception use, who's got the more health progressive ideas about things like marital choice, contraception, and domestic violence? The younger or the older? Who? Younger or older have ideologies that are that are that would ascribe to a healthier to healthier outcomes. I can't hear. I'm sorry. Younger, exactly. So who do we want to be the voices of change? Younger. So we're doing a program right now that's called Youth Care. I have to go back and remind myself what it stands for. Youth Capacity Building to Advocate for Reduction of Early Marriage and Early Pregnancy. And this is actually, you can see, this is the training for the girls. Both girls and boys are doing this because if the girls go out to talk to the boys, or the, will you tell me, who, who do you, who, in, when you guys are out and you're, you know, listening to other people or other people are listening to you, do boys listen to boys more or do boys listen to girls more? And what about girls? Right. So we have this the same, this is, pretty much universal across every country I've ever worked in. So we train boys and girls to be the voices of change in their community. I think one of the most important and interesting findings of this study is that the boys were actually, uh, with the exception of the domestic violence stuff, they were more supportive of girl choice. They were more supportive of, um, of girl choice in marriage and of contraception use in marriage. So the, uh, we can't assume that um, the girls need to always be the voices that need to be heard by the boys around some of these issues because sometimes the boys do have um, ideas about what would be fair and equal for girls that girls aren't even taking in, you know? At the same time, girls hear it from girls more. So we need to, one, work on the normative beliefs within the community, and two, support those youth leaders that can be active voices of change in the community to have the conversations locally. And that's what this program is doing. So that's just kind of a snapshot um, because young leaders can create social change. Uh, and now I think we can open up for questions, but these are just some of the acknowledgments. Okay. Um, right before we start, I'd like to say that um, I repeat that this session is being recorded. So please do not share your name or the school you go to at any time for your privacy. And um, to give the students more opportunity to talk, I suggest that the adults do not ask questions. You can oh, sure. Yeah. Um, talking about what you said about like, the boys um, having that, um, I was reading the autobiography of Noelle Yousafzai, mm -hmm. and it said that like her dad, when he was a kid, was because he was a boy, was getting um, from Pakistan, he was getting like all the good stuff, and he noticed right off that his sisters were not being treated the way that he was, and he, and he wanted it to be fair. So it's not that only the girls are wanting it to be fair, it's also, it's both genders that are wanting this equal. Although if you practiced it for so long to just keep it with one, then I think the older generations, like you said, would, um, well, be more, sort of focus on what's been going on. So, I never thought before that um, just the that, that boys too were also thinking about giving women equal rights in those areas. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering how did this program or project um, come about? Like how did it start like from the base to where it is now? Ah, that's a really great question. Well, so what we we, we initially did national level analyses to understand what the issues are in India. We were hearing about these kinds of concerns, um, but we really didn't know what was going on. And I have to be honest with you, I mean, I really uh, had not been focused on girl-child marriage. I knew adolescent pregnancy had some health consequences, but I had never really thought about the social issue of early marriage of girls until other people started bringing it to my attention. And in the communities, 
um, that we work in, they weren't thinking about it either. The laws have changed and there's been a political movement that's sort of top down. What we started realizing is it's not meaningful when it comes from the largest levels of government, it's important because it establishes justice, legal justice opportunities when things don't go as they should. But, what it, but it doesn't create the buy-in from the communities locally about what they want. And so what we started doing was talking in the local communities that we were working in to understand what do you think the issues are. So here's what we're seeing. Here are the research findings that we're seeing. You talk to us. The original idea was honestly on girl-child marriage. I didn't think about the choice of girls. I was, I just wasn't, that wasn't in my mindset. And, and I mean, I knew it was there, but they were the ones that the youth started bringing it out. And then the issue of the contraception use, the adults were saying, I think these kids don't actually know any, you know, they don't know as much about it. And so we really talked to community leaders and they would guide us on how to ask the questions. And then once we get the research findings, it became very clear that the youth-led program was going to be a better solution than the parent-led program, simply because the youth were farther along on thinking around these issues. Any other questions? Where do you get the resources for your program? Is it donations? Is it the countries? Or how do you gather the resources to bring it along? That's a that's a great question. So I'm I'm a I'm a researcher. So as a professor, I bring in what we call research grant money, and I can get that grant money through something called the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control. Those come from our U.S. government. Um, this particular study was funded partially. Uh, actually, this particular study was funded by our government, the, the National Institutes of uh, National Institutes of Health, with the goal of understanding the issue. And we pilot tested the program with those funds. Now we are actively seeking funds for programmatic dissemination. We think it's a good model, and now it's time to get it out there. Now we'll go to other funders. We might go to UNICEF. Uh, we might go to private donors, um, something like Packard Foundation. Um, you probably have heard of Hewlett Packard. So there can be foundations that can do that. And then we actively work with those organizations that have on-the-ground um, implementers. Uh, to get them the program into their hands so that they could be able to operate it at a wide scale. But. Um, because it's a, a lot of these marriages happen to children and to people who are in poverty, mm -hmm. wouldn't having a kid make it more in poverty over them? Like, do they not realize that or something? That's, That's a really good question. That's a really good question. So, so here's the thing about that. If I, if I marry at 15, right, and now I'm going to have, let's say I'm going to continue to have children well into my 40s, right? I have, I have the children early in marriage because um, that's, you know, you tend to have children early in marriage. But to keep having children, now I have older children to help take care of younger children. And the older children are able to help in the household. So to continue to have children at the later stages is actually supported um, by the older children because they can help with the domestic labor, they can help with the housework, they can bring home an income. Having boys in many contexts is preferred because they stay within the families. This is in some very traditional cultures, and so you'll stay within your community. And the money is, you know, so supporting the land these now young men will stay and they will help with the house, they will help bring an income into the household. So having more of them is actually considered a financial asset. Now, I personally am in a situation where I, we have a, a financial situation and a norm that I expect my children to attend college. I'm thinking, I gotta pay for this college education. I don't want very many children. You people are expensive, by the way. <laughs> so I'm going to be thinking in a very different way than somebody where it's like, this is about a communal living situation where everybody's financial gain will happen at a younger age and will contribute to the overall wealth of a broader family. Because you'd have to wait a long, long time for really to start paying off because it would be continually paying when you because it takes a while to really well, here's the thing. The expenses attached 
to having children in the in the U.S. context is is quite a bit higher than having children in a, like the rural India context. So it isn't so expensive. It's the financial burden of each individual child outside of as long as there's food security. When there's not food security, that creates an issue. And I think in those circumstances, adoption of contraception to reduce the numbers goes up. And do you want to elaborate on how men or boys, a lot of women, are usually like they are forced to keep giving birth until they have boys? Uh, so this is something we call sun preference. And this, because this is, because so, so um, I actually have some quotes online from a study we're doing right now in India where the families basically were talking about the, the tradition of the culture is that the boys will stay, you know, stay close to the family and the boys will help take responsibility for contributing to the family and the boys will help take care of you in older age. Right? And so, but the girls, they marry and they join other families. Well, do I want the people who are going to stick around and stay with me and, and help me more? Or do I want the ones that at a certain point are going to go off and help the other family? Right? So tradition, traditional norms like that will make it a greater interest of a family to want the boy. And so sometimes what we'll see is we'll see uh, girls continue to be born with the goal of getting a boy. And there can be pressure from husbands, from in-laws, but from the women themselves because their value um, as a mother and as someone who's bearing children for the family is then affected by whether or not they had a boy child. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering um, if you just um, actually traveled to India and just saw how this program was like, how it affected the youth, like just hands-on, like were you there actually seeing how um, I get to go into the field and I get to see what's going on. Uh, I didn't get to see them. When they actually go to practice, like as youth leaders, I am probably like the most distracting thing <laughs> that can be out there. So I don't, I don't do that. But what I'll do is I get to go to the trainings and I get to hear from the youth themselves. And I, I, that's it's so rewarding um, because it, it's, it's a reward on multiple levels. You can see how much it's giving to the youth as leaders and what that is for a community. I mean, you know, think for example what you are going to get today and it's not just you that benefits. Your school benefits from this because what you're able to take back into your classroom, what you're able to take out back to your peer groups is is substantially greater from this kind of participation. So I get to see that side of it and then I get to hear from them their experiences of getting to talk to people. And yeah, they, they'll, they'll kind of talk about how that could, that sort of was, you know, changing um, how, that opportunity to have a conversation with a girl where she hadn't thought about it like that. And the other thing is, is that this really is about not just imparting youth leadership like you need to have these messages. It really, I think, is a bigger issue than that. It's more of a, have you thought about it? I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just saying that have you thought about what you want? And have you shared what you want with your parents? Because you may be surprised to learn that they're more open to thinking about what you would want than you'd, ex you'd expect it, you know? Because people don't always ask you the question of what you want. I mean, have you had this experience? Nobody asked you what you wanted, but then once you went and you told them, it had an impact? That's a lot of what this is. Um, so although we're not in that situation over there, yeah, is there any way us teams in the United States or teams in other countries could help mm, this program? I think, I think one of, like you said, we're not in that situation, but I think we are in some sense because there's communities like, I mean, I grew up in PB, but I did see that communities such as um, City Heights where women were having boys and trying to raise their kids to raise one another and that cycle keeps going on. I think we we also need to be aware of what's going on in the U.S. of stuff like that, and then from there also learn from Dr. Um, Raj's research and how we can not only impact other countries but our country as well. So I'll give you an example. So I would say the best if I was to give this to you all to sort of take charge and, and act on it, I can definitely talk to you about what could be done in India.
But I would say to you, what do you think is the attitudes around, is it acceptable to have dating violence? What do you think it is around the attitudes of, does no mean no when a girl says no around sexual activity? Do you think those are issues that are affecting your own local peer groups? Have you ever seen something, just raise your hand, seen a situation where you could see a dynamic in either a dating relationship or a non-dating relationship where a girl was being sexually harassed, grabbed inappropriately at school, or called slut, or, um, and sometimes, girls, be honest, we hear girls calling other girls names like this. Rape jokes. Rape jokes. Tell me the slut equivalent for a boy. People say man whore. I brought it up when people use terms like that, and they say, oh, I say man whore when a guy does it. How common is that? But how com yeah, but how common is that? Like how common is that? So we obviously have different ideologies, expectation, treatment of boys and girls here, right? So what are you guys so first of all, do you think that's true? Do you think that there's differential treatment on the likelihood of a girl to get sexually violated than a boy to get sexually violated? Yes. When girls wear short shorts and she gets raped. I mean, I've heard it, like, oh, she deserved it. I don't hear these because no one will say things like this in front of me. <laughs> and I, I, I don't, I don't um, and, I, and I suspect many girls in this room won't, but I, I would ask the boys, and you don't have to raise your hand, oh, totally, my best friend said that. But have you heard things like, I'd rape that? You know, I'd be all over that. As if you have the choice, like, you know, there's a, there's a dialogue that should be happening there. <laughs> um, you know, I think that every time that we say nothing, or when the girl, I knew a girl when I was in college, and uh, she didn't show up on time for her, when her boyfriend expected her to, and he smashed the windows on her car. Like, that's nuts. He's nuts. And she, he, she was like, I know, he just, you know, he's just really jealous, and... <laughs> Or what about as simple as, have you, for girls, boys may not hear this part of it. This is such a heterosexually biased conversation, by the way. I'm just owning that right now. <laughs> but I, I, it helps me get this across. So I'm sorry that uh, for those of you who are invested in understanding these issues more for our LGBT, I, I'm not, we just don't have the time to cover it all. Um, but how many girls have heard things like, yeah, he doesn't like when I wear that because, you know, he doesn't really, he's not very comfortable. I see the nods. Or... He, yeah, I don't really hang out with that guy anymore because he doesn't really, I don't know, he's uncomfortable with me hanging out with him. Right. Or sometimes it's even, he doesn't really want me to go out with the mall with you guys. Or, he doesn't say it, but you know. You know she's not going out to the mall because he's being a jerk. <laughs> um, those are not most, I want to just add, those are not most boys, right? But when you hear it, that's kind of a sign. It is a sign. And so the question becomes, do we talk about that? Do we say, that's kind of controlling, you know, or I'm a little worried. Um, I would say for girls who know people in that situation, there's, there's stuff online to basically say signs of a controlling relationship. Show it to her. I think most girls are shocked. They're like, oh my God, I had no idea. Um, I actually think boys often have a greater awareness of like what can cross a line unless it's the guy that's actually crossing the line. <laughs> so what I would say to a lot of the guys is you hear that language that we don't. And I now will ask the boys, have you ever heard something where you were like, yeah, I heard something that I wish I wouldn't have heard for boys in the room? Have you ever heard anything like that? Something that you kind of felt like was degrading to women or belittling? No hands holding, hands holding up, that's okay, but I'm seeing the nods. You know, and the question is, do you say anything? Do you speak out or do you just let it happen? And I'll, I said this in the last group, too. My son, um, there was a whole thing where somebody was saying, that's so gay. You know, he's 11. This was happening a couple of years ago. And we basically, or, you know, I said to him, you know, when you don't say something, here's the problem of not saying it. When you don't say it, that makes it, whether you want to take this on or not, it makes it more acceptable every time there's a hate crime against a gay person. Because what it does is it creates a climate of acceptability. So you guys are really needing, so you want to know what to do? 
I think that's a place where all of you can really be an agent of change. I see so many programs out there for, well, I asked the, this of the ones before, how many of you have gotten an awareness training at your school around issues of dating violence or sexual violence? Okay. How many of you have gotten an awareness training around issues of drug and alcohol use? One in five girls in high schools have been victims of dating violence. So we clearly aren't doing our jobs as adults to make sure you know that. Can you help us? Can you be that voice of change in your community, in your schools? Because I just don't have a lot of hope that it's going to come from the adults. I've seen your bullying curriculum, or at least San Diego Unifieds. It doesn't really have this as part of it. All right. Last question before we end. I just want to say back to where you said, um, you know, where people would say if she were booty shorts or something like that, that she deserved it. I think that nobody, even if they were naked, doesn't deserve A victim never deserves it. It's not their fault just because, I mean, victim is never in the fault. It's always the person who does it. <laughs> That's a great answer.